Why does Venus have an atmosphere if it doesn't have a magnetosphere? What's the best target for a gravitational lens telescope? And where is the best place to put a rocket facility? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers. Now, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I will answer them here. Just a reminder, we record this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to be a part of the show, come join my channel live Mondays, 5pm. And then that gets edited down into the question show that you're watching right now. All right, let's get into the questions. Homu, how does Venus hold on to its atmosphere without a magnetosphere? Right, Venus doesn't have a global planet wide magnetosphere like the Earth does like Jupiter does like Saturn does. It has maybe a patchy magnetosphere down at the surface, but it doesn't have this big protective global magnetosphere. And we know that the magnetosphere around Earth helps protect us from the radiation from the sun, you've got the solar winds, you've got coronal mass ejections, things like that, that are buffeting the planet, and the magnetosphere redirects that towards the poles and stops it from really interacting across the atmosphere. But the Earth does have a tail that's facing away from the sun. So some of our atmosphere is being blown off into space. But Venus has this incredibly dense, thick atmosphere. If you're down at the surface of Venus, it's like 90 times the density of Earth. And so how did Venus hold on to its atmosphere, even though it's a lot closer to the sun. And when you look at the composition of the atmosphere, that will tell you what's going on. It's mostly carbon dioxide. There's also sulfuric acid. And there is actually a surprising amount of nitrogen. There's, there's twice as much nitrogen in the atmosphere of Venus than there is on Earth. But the thing that's missing is hydrogen. You don't have water. H2O. And it's the hydrogen atoms that were blown away from Venus by the sun by the solar wind over billions and billions of years. Every time you got a free floating hydrogen atom in the atmosphere, when you got ultraviolet rays hitting water molecules breaking them apart, then the hydrogen would get blown off into space and over a long period of time Venus dried out. Carbon dioxide is a heavier gas than our air. So if you have if you release a bunch of carbon dioxide, it will sink down to the bottom of the air. So it's the it's that free hydrogen, it's the water Venus, even though it has that incredibly dense, enormous amount of atmosphere is bone dry. And that's why finding life on Venus is probably going to be so tricky, except maybe somewhere in the atmosphere, somehow interacting with the sulfuric acid to live somehow, if it even exists. All right, at this point, you probably noticed the Star Wars planet that appeared over my shoulder. And this is a way for you to vote for the question that you thought was the best. So last week, the winner was for KKGT 6591, asking about the major areas of astrophysics that aren't being reported. And I went into this big, long, excited rant about time domain astronomy and multi messenger astronomy. And that was the question that everybody liked the best. So congratulations to KKGT and me we made a great team. All right, so just put the name of the planet that you want to vote for into the comments down below. And then we will count them all up next week. And we'll tell you what the winner was. Benjamin Vasquez, you've talked about the gravitational lens telescope before. But as I see the biggest drawback is that you can only see things on the opposite side of the sun. So you have to pick your target. What target would you like to see to get first priority? Right, the solar gravitational lens, this is this idea of sending a spacecraft out to about 1000 astronomical units away from the sun. And when you get that far, then the gravity of the sun acts like a natural telescope lens that focuses the light on the other side of it. And if you took a one meter telescope out to the solar gravitational lens, and you pointed it directly at an exoplanet, you would see a one megapixel image. So right now, JWST, the upcoming extremely large telescope, the best telescopes that humanity can make in the near future will give us one pixel. Only if we built a telescope that was about 10,000 kilometers across, could we get 
the same kind of resolution as using the, the gravity of the sun as a natural lens. But you're exactly right, you get one target, and not just like one star or one region in the sky, but like one planet, you have to be that precise with where you position the spacecraft so that it's looking past the gravitational lens and getting this focus. Where would I want? Well, the answer is that I don't know. And nobody knows because there hasn't been enough work to find the interesting candidates. We've got the work that's happening from JBOC to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. You've got upcoming missions like Ariel, which will study the atmospheres of thousands of exoplanets. You've got the upcoming extremely large telescope. This is this 39 meter telescope that's going to be in in Chile and will be able to directly image Earth sized worlds orbiting around sun like stars, but only give us one pixel. And so it's going to take us a while. It's probably going to take us 10 years to find the most compelling target for a, a solar gravitational lens telescope. Once that target has been chosen, then it's kind of locked in you launch the mission, you're then looking at 20 years for your spacecraft to get out to the solar gravitational lens. And then you can start making those observations. And probably over the course of 20 years, vastly more interesting targets will have appeared, but it's too late, you've cast your die. So we have to be very careful, we have to find lots and lots of really amazing candidate worlds. And then from that gigantic list, astronomers will have to pick their most most favorite. And that's the one that we send the mission to Arjon. Why aren't there more launch complexes near or on the equator? Wouldn't you get more of a kick from there? Absolutely. The Earth is a ball that is spinning. And when you're at the equator, you are getting about 1650 kilometers per hour more speed than if you're standing at the pole. And so the best thing to do is get as close to the equator of the Earth when you want to launch a rocket. You've got sort of two ways you can go with this one is you can decrease the launch mass of the payload. In other words, you can use less propellant, or you can launch a larger mass with the same amount of propellant. Take your pick but you want to get as close as possible to the equator, but it's smooth. I mean, like the Kennedy Space Center is located at 28 degrees north latitude. So it's not really that close to the equator. And so they get say, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but like a 1000 kilometers per hour of a bonus, but only get the full 1600. The closest major launch facility that we have to the equator is the European Space Agency's uh, Kauru Space Complex, which is in uh, French Guiana, and it is 5.2 degrees north in South America. So that's really close. And that gives you a pretty big boost for your spacecraft. There have been launch complexes that have been right on the equator. There was this thing called sea launch, which operated out of Long Beach, California, they had this giant barge and like an old oil tanker. Anyway, they would take this barge down to the equator and they would launch rockets right at the equator and they would come back to their port, swap out rockets, do upgrades, etc. And so they're able to take advantage of that, but they get all the downsides that you have to go on your boat, go down to the equator, go through storms before you can actually launch a rocket. An interesting compromise has come up fairly recently, and this is Virgin Orbit, and they launch rockets off of a specially modified airplane. And so what's cool is they can fly out of say, England, they can fly down to the equator, and then they can go in the direction that the Earth is turning, and then they can launch their rocket, take advantage of being close to the equator, and then they can fly back up to their landing pad. But then you get all the downsides of it's only a small amount of payload that you can launch from an aircraft, etc. So like, what is the best solution? Like the best solution is probably to put your launch complex at the top of a mountain in Ecuador, which is right on the equator. And it's high up through as much of the atmosphere as possible. But then you have all the downsides, like you imagine taking a rocket all the way up this long treacherous mountain road to get to the top of this launch complex that sounds hard. So everything is compromises. There's no perfect launch site today. I can imagine maybe in the future, there'll be just this perfect site somewhere in Africa, or somewhere else in South America, probably Africa. 
and that would be like the world's greatest spaceport. So maybe that's a you know, a business opportunity for them in the future. Mr. Alikido. I know this might be a bit pedantic, but we should always say microgravity and not zero gravity, you let it slip sometimes as we all do. All right, I'm gonna go on a bit of a rant now. When you're floating in space, when you're in free fall in orbit around the Earth, you are indeed experiencing gravity, you're experiencing about 90% of the amount of gravity that you would experience if you're down on the surface of the Earth, you're also experiencing gravity from the moon, gravity from Jupiter, gravity from the sun, gravity from every single object in the observable universe. And yet people call it zero gravity. Even I apparently call it zero gravity, and it's not zero gravity. And so the preferred term is microgravity. But it's not that either 90% of Earth gravity does not feel like microgravity. It's just because you are in free fall, the forces on you are perfectly balanced, so that you don't experience a firm footing. But that's it's not zero gravity, it's not microgravity, it's plenty of gravity. So I think we just need a new definition to, to say, oh, zero gravity is bad, but microgravity is better is not true. So like, really, what you're not experiencing is weight. So there's weightlessness. I'd say weightlessness is the best term, because you still are experiencing the gravity, you still have mass, but you're not experiencing weight. So I'm going to say zero gravity, microgravity are both wrong and we'll go with weightlessness from here on out. Now I just got to remember it. Random one. What would the Milky Way look like from the International Space Station? They always show the Earth, but never the Milky Way. There are plenty of examples of video and pictures taken from the International Space Station that show the Milky Way. My, my favorite ones are where you've got some camera that's doing a time lapse image of the Earth, and you're seeing the auroras below. And then you watch the Milky Way rise, you know, when you're orbiting above the Earth. So this has been done many times, what would the Milky Way look like from the International Space Station, the same as it looks at really dark skies, except even better. One of the things that's kind of surprising about being in orbit and being above the atmosphere is that it actually becomes quite difficult to tell your stars because all of the stars are so bright. And I've interviewed astronauts in the past, and especially the ones who are amateur astronomers, and I asked them, like, what's it like to be in space, you know, you know, your stars, you know, your way around the night sky. Was it that but better? And the impression that I've got is actually it's hard because the stars are so bright, they're all bright. It's actually really tricky to find your bearings and go, okay, there's Orion, there's the Big Dipper, I know where I am, and I can start finding the various objects in the night sky, but the Milky Way just would look brighter. And crisper without all of that atmospheric disturbance. So it would be the best place to see the Milky Way. Christopher Levesque, if Jupiter is surrounded by flammable gas, what keeps it from catching fire and becoming a star? <laughs> There's a bunch of issues here. Let's start with the the catching fire and becoming a star part. So the sun is not a star because it's on fire. And, and that was like a theory that astronomers had for a long time. When they looked at the sun, they tried to figure out what it was. Why is there this big hot ball of fire in the sky? What's it made of? And they tried to calculate how long the sun would be if it was made out of coal, or if it was made out of wood, and it was burning. And they used that to calculate how old they thought the sun was, they were super wrong, because that's all what's happening. The sun is a fusion process where the immense amount of gravity is pulling inward this giant cloud of hydrogen gas, so that the density and temperature at the core of the sun are so hot, and so dense that nuclear fusion can begin that fusion produces an enormous amount of energy that pushes out against the sun, and keeps it in this sort of hydrostatic equilibrium where the force of gravity is pulling inward and the radiation pressure of the from the fusion is pushing outward and the sun is in balance. And that's why it has the size and the shape that it does. Jupiter is made of exactly the same stuff that the sun is It's made of hydrogen, helium, some other trace gases probably has a solid core. Why isn't Jupiter a star? It's because it doesn't have enough mass, you would need to go and find another 70 to 80 Jupiters, pull them all together into the solar system, mash them all together for you to get the smallest possible dwarf star for hydrogen fusion to actually begin. 
But like, why doesn't all of that hydrogen just burn, right? Like it's it's all there. And we know that hydrogen is very flammable here on Earth. Well, hydrogen is flammable on Earth because there's oxygen in the atmosphere. And for you to be able to burn hydrogen, you need an oxidizer. And there's plenty of it in the air, but there is no oxidizer in orbit around Jupiter. Without a Jupiter's worth of oxygen to be mashed together, then you could light Jupiter on fire if you had this oxygen Jupiter. But until then, Jupiter would just remain as it is not on fire. Neil McEwen, do you think you'll get to space in your lifetime? Will I get to space in my lifetime? I don't think so. I think, you know, I'm 51 years old at this point. So let's say, you know, if I, I got 30 more years in me at this point, 30 more years of like can go to space, maybe 20 more years of can go to space before I get too old. So will we see prices for spaceflight come down below mortgage your house prices in 20 years? I don't think so. I think it's going to still be the place of billionaires and multimillionaires, like maybe it'll be multimillionaires will be able to go to space, as opposed to the billionaires going to space, instead of it costing you $50 million to go to space, it'll cost you $5 million to go to space. But that's still more money than I can afford to go to space. But you know, like join my Patreon. And I'm gonna let you on a little secret. I don't want to go to space that badly that I would be willing to mortgage all of my possessions. Like, like if, if SpaceX showed up and said, Hey, Fraser, you want a free trip to space, I would take it, right? Tim Dodd is going to go to space and travel around the moon. And I didn't even apply for that position. I like Earth. And like, I know that seeing our planet from space would be this mind blowing, brain expanding experience. And then you'd want to come home. The space tourism that I'm actually kind of excited about are these high altitude balloon adventures that are being developed where you'll fly up to say 25 kilometers altitude. So you're, you're definitely going to be able to see the earth from this really high vantage point. But you're experiencing gravity. Uh, there's a bathroom, you, you can have snacks, and you can look out these windows. That sounds really civilized to me. So I think like if I could choose like a blue origin zero G flight, or go on one of these balloons, I would take the balloon every time. There are definitely some places that I would like to see like I'd love to go and to see the moon. I'd love to walk on the surface of the moon experience what one sixth gravity feels like I'd love to be on Mars and try that out. But I wouldn't want to stay. I would want to go to these places like I would want to go see Antarctica and I want to come home to Earth, which is the best planet in the universe for us. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as the other things we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. This allows us to keep minimum ads for everybody. Like as you can see, there are no ads in the middle of this video. Thanks, patrons. As a patron, you'll get an ad free experience on university.com for life. Even if you unsubscribe, you'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who's already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Archer, Jim Bell, Stephen Rogers, Yule Bosch, Logan Green, Alan, David Sawyer, Matt Reichel, Noel Venisel, and George. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Faisal, is the sun moving towards the center of the galaxy with the passage of time? As you probably know, there is a supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way with 4 million times the mass of the sun. Are all of the stars and planets and gas in the Milky Way just swirling up going like a whirlpool going down into that supermassive black hole? No, no, everything is just going to continue orbiting exactly as it is uh, around and around the Milky Way it takes about 225 million years for the Milky Way to turn once. So the place where the Earth is today, goes all the way around the Milky Way and returns back to its starting point over the course of 225 million years, which means that that the sun has only gone a couple of dozen times around the Milky Way in its entire life, which is pretty amazing. So it's more like the grooves on a record player. Oh, you, you might not even know what that reference is. Um, 
<laughs> uh, but imagine you're spinning a plate and so you're going around and around and around on the edge of the plate and you're not actually falling down into the middle of the Milky Way. But there are gravitational interactions between the various stars as they go past one another. And so the sun every few hundred thousand years every few million years, it gets close enough to another star that the two influence each other's orbits around the Milky Way and can push them closer to the center of the Milky Way farther from the center of the Milky Way. And that's one of the reasons why we don't know where all of the other stars that we formed with in the stellar nebula, we don't know where they are. Because over the billions of years, all of those gravitational interactions between all the different stars have shuffled up all of the stars that we were born with in the stellar nebula. So we may get slightly closer to the center of the Milky Way or slightly farther over time, it's all completely random, but it's almost impossible for us to get really close down into the very center to be able to see the supermassive black hole. That is not a destination for the sun. Craig Hansen, what happens when the space elevator cable snaps? It's a very bad day. With a space elevator, you've got this cable that is extending up from the surface of the Earth all the way out to geostationary orbit and beyond because you need to balance out the weight of the space elevator. And at this point, when you think about it, right, you've got this mass, like usually it's like one way to do it is you put an asteroid at the geostationary orbit and then you reel a cable down from the asteroid down to the surface of the Earth. And then it's and then you bolt it onto the surface of the Earth. But if you don't have a an asteroid that you can attach it to, you could also just start at the geostationary orbit, reel your cable in both directions at the same time. And you will balance out the forces on it until you get to the surface of the Earth, and then you bolt it down and then you've got to have the equivalent amount of mass going off into into space. And so then imagine that space elevator gets snipped at some point. Well, the part that is above the snip point will drift away because now there's more mass that is pulling it away from the Earth. But then the part that is below the snipped part will then fall onto the Earth and wrap itself around the planet. And when you think about geostationary orbit being 35,000 kilometers away, like that's almost enough to go around the Earth once like I think what the circumference of the Earth is like 40,000 kilometers. So you would wrap the Earth with your cable, and it would be a very bad day. But if it was snipped really close, like say in just the first 100 kilometers of altitude, the entire space elevator would drift away. And the only the 100 kilometer part would fall down onto the earth, hopefully in the ocean. So it really just how much damage gets done to planet Earth depends on how far away the cut is on the space elevator. Bobbert Bobbert, if we assume near light speeds are achievable by manned spacecraft, doesn't the time dilation pose a significant problem that Alta needs addressing before actually doing it? Yeah, if you're going to hop in a spacecraft and you're going to go close to the speed of light, then you are going to experience a different amount of time than the people that you leave behind on Earth. How much time differential you get depends on the speed that you're going. So if you hopped in a spaceship and you went in one direction and you started accelerating at 1G, you could do that for years and years and years and years. And if you did for like 40 years, you would experience enough time dilation that say 10 billion years would pass back on Earth. But you would still have only experienced about 40 years. So that's fine. Like, assuming that you're young when you hop in your spaceship and away you fly, then you just experience, you know, uh, everyone that you've ever known, even your very planet has died, but you're fine. So what is the significant problem? I mean, I think that the fact that you experience time dilation when you're traveling to some other star system, for example, I put that all in the wind column, like it may be a 10 year journey, as the crow flies, <laughs> according to the speed of light. But if you're experiencing the journey, well, then the distance is going to shorten from your perspective, you're going to experience maybe five years, three years, one year if you're going fast enough. And so the trip is over really quickly, you don't need a lot of supplies. 
Um, yeah, you arrive at your destination and everybody is 10 years older. Your twin is now a completely different age than you. But you know, you're on another planet. So like nobody said there wouldn't be some downside to traveling at close to the speed of light. I would take it. I totally worth it. In fact, I, being able to travel into the future almost feels like an upside. And I've mentioned in the past, I'd love to see the future. So I mentioned earlier on the show, like, would I really go to space? Probably not like unless it was really cheap. But if someone was going to offer me a trip at close to the speed of light so that I could experience time dilation and fast forward into the future that I might take Timberwolf. Why do we bother with Mars Rover Europa plume probe space telescope trips if we know hey it could always hopefully find more info instead of just making a machine that we know can be definitive? Because it's almost impossible to make a machine that's definitive. This is part of the problem with the Viking landers that were sent to Mars, like someone said, what's a way that we could detect if there's life on the surface of Mars? Let's take the Martian regolith, let's feed it nutrients, let's warm it up. And let's see if the bacteria in the Martian soil gives off the kinds of gases that we would see here on Earth. And so they built an experiment and they flew it to Mars and they landed and they scooped up the regolith and they exposed it to higher temperatures and they fed it nutrients. And what do you know, gases came off of it case closed, except it was inconclusive that scientists thought of ways that that just dead rocks could still give off very similar gases to what was seen in the Viking experiment. And so astronomers argue about it today about whether or not they actually saw traces of life in the Viking experiment, because we don't see trees on Mars. So if there is any life on Mars, it's going to be hard to find. And we don't know how hard it is. I'll give you like one of my favorite examples analogies. And this is the Soviet Venera program, which which landed spacecraft on the surface of Venus. Nobody knew what the conditions were like down at the surface of Venus. We talk about the temperatures today, 470 degrees Celsius, 90 atmospheric pressures, but but we didn't know. And so the Soviets built a spacecraft that they thought was tough enough to get down to the surface of Venus, and it died. And then they sent another one. You know, this time they built it tougher to handle the conditions that killed the previous one. And it died. And they did that a bunch of times until finally they were getting them down to the surface of Venus and they were lasting longer and longer. Like the longest lasting one was still just a few dozen minutes before, you know, it succumbed to the heat and died. But how do we know what it's going to take to do science when we don't know what it's going to take? All you can do is is try your best. And if it fails, then you try something else. You try harder until finally you get the result that you're looking for. Like if there was a silver bullet solution to be able to find out whether or not there's life on Mars or in the plumes of Europa, or if there's life on another exoplanet, that would be the one that we would do. But nobody knows. And so you just try ideas, you come up with hypotheses, and you see if it works, and you gather the data, and then you study the data. And I think the lesson that was learned with exploring Mars was don't be so hasty, don't just try to jump right for the result that's going to tell you whether or not there's life on Mars, take it slow, build up the case. And as you go, you'll learn more and more about the clues about what's like on Mars. What were the conditions of water? Where was it wet? What kind of organic molecules were present? And over time, you will build up this story. And I think like, we need to be prepared for the question of whether or not there's life on other planets in the universe to take a long time maybe we won't get a definitive answer in any of our lifetimes. Anyone watching the show? Because it's really hard to find definitive proof of life. Look at Venus. Venus is right next door. It's this planet that has the same mass as Earth, same gravity as Earth. It has a thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide, one of the waste gases produced by life. And it doesn't look like there's any life there. But astronomers are still arguing about whether or not there's the traces of life in the atmosphere of Venus. It's inconclusive. And Venus is right next door. Think about how hard it's going to be for us to come up with some kind of conclusive answer. So scientists work with the best data that they have. They work with the budget that they're given. They answer as many questions as they can. And science just keeps stumbling forward until 
it eventually finds its way to what seems to be the right answer. And there's no shortcutting the process. Hey, Mercury, thanks for fielding all these questions. Here's one more. What's been your favorite recent sci fi novel? I just finished Project Hail Mary and I'm about to go back for a second read. Well, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that I've been doing this book club with the readers where they recommend books, but I've learned this horrible mistake about this, which is that if someone recommends a book to me, then and it's the beginning of a series that I'm going to want to read the series. And then if I really enjoyed the series, and I'm going to read more books by that author. And so the the series that I'm reading right now, and I'm just about to start the fourth book in the Revelation space series by Alistair Reynolds, and they're so good. They're so weird. And they're like if Mass Effect and Foundation had a baby. That is the that is the series. And if you love the Mass Effect game, you, you will love Revelation Space. It's clearly the concept that that many of the ideas in in Mass Effect were inspired by. Uh, so hopefully I'll have this book finished in another week or so and then I'll be able to go back to the pool and pick up another book. And hopefully this time around, I won't make this rookie mistake of choosing a new series to go down that I will pick a one time one and done book, which is recommended by one of the viewers. So if you haven't already, there's a link to the book club at Goodreads. And you can suggest books to me and I will pick another one in about another week. So hopefully I'll, I'll finish this <laughs> Revelation Space series and move on. But if you haven't already read them, I really am, am enjoying them. Johnny Appleseed, have you ever seen a UFO? You know, have I ever seen an object flying in the sky that I couldn't identify? No, I've always been able to identify all of the objects that I've seen in the sky. Now I haven't known exactly which airplane I'm looking at or which Starlink train I'm looking at. But just in general, I've never seen anything that I that I don't know what it is. And this is common, like when a person spends a lot of time out under the night sky and is looking around and learning to identify all the things that they're looking at, then you kind of recognize everything that you see, like, Oh, there's Venus. Oh, there's Jupiter. Oh, look, Venus and Jupiter are really close in the sky this night. There's an airplane, there's a satellite. But no, I've never seen anything that I wasn't able to identify. Mendel, are the Hubble tension crises and the accepted fact that the rate of expansion has increased two sides of the same coin, one is a crisis and the other is a fact that people just accept. So the Hubble tension or the crisis in cosmology is where astronomers measure the expansion rate of the universe in recent history by looking at type one, a supernova by looking at variable stars in other galaxies, by measuring the expansion rate of the universe around us to get one number. And then when you measure the expansion rate of the universe in the cosmic microwave background radiation, you get a different number. And those two numbers have been measured so well that their error bars don't overlap. That is the Hubble tension. And so this idea that the expansion of the universe is accelerating this idea of dark energy, that at about 7 billion years, the expansion rate of the universe started to increase, that's baked in. So astronomers say, we know what the expansion rate of the universe is today. And we know how much of that is due to the additional expansion rate, thanks to dark energy. And they still don't match up on what they should be. So you know, dark energy starts out being a very small impact in the universe. And then over time, it builds and builds and builds. But yeah, astronomers are aware of dark energy when they think about the crisis in cosmology, and it doesn't resolve it still. So they still don't know why when you measure the expansion rate of the universe today, and you measure it at the beginning of the universe, you get two different numbers, and their error bars don't overlap. And the quality of both measurements is really good. And so it means there's something else. There's some other new physics. We don't understand the cosmology of the universe. There's some fundamental thing that's wrong with the way the rates are being measured. There's something to explain this. Um, and whoever figures this out will probably get a Nobel Prize. So the things you've thought of, 
I mean, you go for that Nobel Prize, or it's possible that astronomers have thought of that. Critical mass 22. If gravity on Earth is in direct proportion to its mass, why is the human on top of Mount Everest slightly lighter, even though standing on an upward extension of that same mass? The farther you are away from the center of the mass, the less gravity than you're going to experience. Like if you were off the Earth, and you were say out by the moon, you would be experiencing some fraction of the gravity that you would experience if you're down on the surface, you would be lighter. Even when you're in space, when you're orbiting the Earth, you're experiencing about 90% of the gravity you would experience if you're down on the surface. And so anything that gets you farther away from the center of the mass of the Earth means that you experience less gravity, you become lighter. And so you are slightly lighter, like not very much, not so you could tell, you know, another thing you can do if you want to get a little lighter is go down to the equator where the speed of the planet turning will be pushing you outward. And so you will lose a little bit of weight. So like maybe the best thing that you can do is go stand at the top of the mountain that's in Ecuador, that's like really close to the equator. And it's also the farthest away from the center of the earth. And that's how you can experience the least amount of gravity while still standing on, on planet earth. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Of course, we do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to join us live, there should be a notification a reminder here on the channel. And don't forget to vote for the question that you like the best. We'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all of the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to George, Jeremy Matter, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.